Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 97th session in the Gerhard Center webinar series. Today, we are hosting um, a very special guest speaker, Eva Yazhari, who will lead today's discussion around building wealth by being true to yourself. Eva Yazhari is a seasoned investor, conscious entrepreneur, author, and the CEO and the founder of Beyond Capital. It's an early stage impact venture capital fund um, offering a diversified portfolio of early stage purpose driven companies in need to have sectors emerging markets. Previously, Yazhari was a vice president at an Entrust Capital. Her team invested over $5 billion into uh, top hedge funds. She, she specialized in due diligence and underlying fund portfolio analysis. Yes, Harry is an active investor and the proponent of the 100% impact portfolio approach. She is a member of the YPO and on the executive committee of the Personal Investing Network. She serves on corporate boards, including Karma Healthcare and Frontier Markets, along with the Barnard Athena Center, and lead the learning pillar of the Young Presidents Organization's YPO Impact Invest Investing Initiative. Yes, Harry is also the co-host of the Beyond Capital podcast, uh, founder of the Conscious Investor Online Magazine, and the author of The Good Your Money Can Do. Thank you so much, Eva, for accepting our invitation to lead today's discussion. Uh, the floor is yours. We're looking forward to a great discussion. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here with everyone. I will start sharing my screen and then we can take things forward from here. So, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Eva Yazari. I am an author. I am the general partner of Beyond Capital Ventures. I am an Africa investor and an emerging markets investor. And today we are going to what I would call discover how investing should be about more than money. I believe that investing is about character. Oh, and by the way, I have to tell you that everything I'm telling you is not investment advice. The lawyers make me do that. So investing is really about character and character is really about digging inward and not just continuing to move with our money like we are a pawn in a chess game. I can imagine that some people who are here, right, so some people who are here may feel and have felt that their money is just a pawn in a chess game of cryptocurrency, big banks, and you know all sorts of other forces that tell us where to invest, but really tell us you know places to invest that are not connected to us as individuals. So have you ever really felt that your investments were either inconsequential or unrelated to you as a person? Well, here today, we're going to talk about how to change that, because I would love to show you how thoughtful and conscious investing is the key to living a life connected to your values and your values are your own. And in other words, build wealth while remaining true to who you are. Also today, I think we are lucky enough to live in a time where we can have a material impact on a social or environmental problem with little sacrifice to our own lives. And this is a quote from my book, um, The Good Your Money Can Do. I always have to hold it up because it's always here on my desk beside me. But to take this paradigm a little bit farther, we will talk about money, a subject and career I discovered unexpectedly, and how it relates to having an impact. This is me as a teenager. I grew up removed from finance and Wall Street literally separated by many bridges and tunnels on an island called Staten Island, which is a borough of New York City. So I am American. I'm the only child of two working artists and teachers. And my parents set me up really well. I attended Barnard College, which is Columbia University's all-girls school. Yet I was woefully unprepared coming from a Staten Island public school. 
And I quickly switched from pre-med to math simply because of the pressure that a pre-med curriculum had for somebody like me that went to a public school. And one day a friend told me about a night investment banking internship at Merrill Lynch, and it sounded fun. Um, Plus it paid more than my work study job. And therefore I fell into finance in my twenties. But what I found on Wall Street, and I, I'm curious if this resonates with any of you, and of course, would love to hear your comments and thoughts um, after this talk um, in a little bit. What I found was pivotal. While I gained lifelong skills around finance um, and financial modeling, I also got a good look at the underbelly of capitalism, which does not work for everybody. And I think we we all, whether you you know outwardly agree or not, um, I think we all feel that on a daily basis in today's world. It never worked for the low-income kids in my high school that never made it to graduation. And it was not working for most women who were missing from every single conference room that I sat in. The reality is Wall Street is a gated community, the opposite of where I personally grew up. And all my life, I spent time on the outside looking in across the water, literally to Manhattan and to Wall Street itself. But then something really different happened or something very historical happened, which was in 2008, the financial crisis occurred. Bernie Madoff stole millions, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt, and new billionaires were actually minted off the backs of working class families dealing with insurmountable debt. Meanwhile, I felt like I was speaking a language that my parents couldn't even understand. You know, they're artists. They would say, what is a hedge fund? I felt like we were really in in very different worlds. And so I told a mentor I wanted to pivot from hedge funds to more socially meaningful work. And she replied with a well-known adage that it's impossible to do good without first making a lot of money. Does that sound familiar to everybody, anybody here? Well, of course she worked for a billionaire, so it was easy for her to say, but I knew something wasn't right. It didn't feel right. Inequity in finance, really no path forward for female investors. I know you know, the American University in Cairo does, does a lot for, for women in their program. So I know this isn't a core, a core um, value, um, but this was not in line with my core values either. And that's when I first learned about impact investing which is the ability for impact to be baked into a profitable business model. And finally, it seemed like I could find a common language with my parents about money so I could talk about more than just money. But it was really too good to be true, um, to be honest. And along my journey over the last decade plus, I realized that impact investing is is still not accessible to everyone. Even impact investing, an industry with all its promise for social good, is not actually inclusive. I mean, I think if we were to survey the the folks that are on this call and ask, you know, do you know exactly how to become an impact investor? The the probably more common response would be no, because it does still speak the language of billionaires and caters to the ultra wealthy. And no one really seems to know how easy it could be to think about where your money sleeps at night, where you're banking, or or where your retirement savings are actually invested because there really are so many ways to bring your personality and your character into your money decisions. So today we're gonna talk about how everyone really deserves a seat at this table. These, these are women, people from Staten Island like me or you know, famous uh, comedians like Colin Jost or the rap gang Wu-Tang Clan, we all came from Staten Island. People from Egypt, people from Alaska, people from Africa, and many more places can all expand their view of investing and really make it personal and build wealth at the same time. So you can create a legacy that feels right um, for you. The reality is you're already an impact investor, whether, whether, you're, whether you call yourself that or not, because every investment that we make has a positive or negative impact. There really is no neutral investment. Um, so I wanna make a difference in your money today Um, And I'll provide you with five pointers to help you build wealth while remaining true to yourself. And the reason I'm telling you this, and I'm really grateful for this opportunity to be here today is because on my own path, I can never look back when it comes to being authentic to who I am. And it has created a tremendous amount of wealth. So the first point is to challenge your assumptions and acknowledge that it is possible to enjoy your money while doing more. 
So let's first acknowledge that the stock market really has been off base with the Main Street economy for a while. This is not what an efficient market is meant to be. Yet most of us follow CNBC or you know, other banking analysts advice blindly. And we lack pride in where our money is actually invested and banked and where our money is spent every day. So why can't pride be the norm? This is my son, but um, what I mean to say here is that we're all forward looking people. We all see global injustice, we see climate change. And for, I know we know, all want to see change um, and we know there has to be another way. And for example, my son, Alessandro, he's very concerned about Trash Island or also known as the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And at his mother, as his mother, I need to have an answer for him about what I can do and what our family can do about the pollution in our oceans. And as I mentioned, there has to be another way. And you know, I'm gonna give you the statistic for, from America, because only half of Americans invest. Um, and because only half of Americans invest, you may not automatically know that it is possible to line up your resources with your values and to feel good about it. Um, because investing is really not accessible. And even fewer people know that you can even do something about it. Years ago, I personally noticed that my investment portfolio did not align with my values. Companies that were environmentally harmful made making like to tobacco products, et cetera, were in my portfolio. And luckily a mentor told me I could dig in, I could ask more questions. And when I asked my intimidating Swiss advisor, because I was living in Zurich at the time, he you know, encouraged me to actively look for stocks in my portfolio that did not fit my values and, um, and point them out. And when I asked my advisor, um, I wasn't given a good answer. Um, and I made the decision then and there that there had to be another way to build wealth and to create my legacy authentically. And since then, what I've done is I've set out a path to achieve that. And I want to take you all on this journey today, both demystifying investing and cleaning it up, or what I call detoxing it in the process. So in my book, The Good, Good Your Money Can Do, um, I give readers a hands-on experience-based steps to build wealth by becoming a more conscious investor. I encourage you to check it out. It is really meant to be a guidebook for anybody who's looking to line up their values um, with their money and all their resources. But one of the most common misconceptions um, are out there is that um, investing is too risky, when in reality, it's investing in the wrong way that is too risky. And here's a great statistic to share that. Um, we know that um, in the 10 year period between 2005 and 2015, 15 out of the 17 companies that went bankrupt in the S&P 500 index of companies had a low environmental, social and governance rating. We also know that a study of four CEO exits in 2018 found that 46% of them were due to ethical lapses rather than financial concerns. Um, yet we still struggle to abandon these old assumptions and you see a lot more um, data here, including other facts to illustrate, such as 85% of purpose-driven companies exhibit stronger growth than average. 66% of consumers say, say they would actually pay more for products and services from socially responsible companies. Unilever is also um, you know, seeing their sustainable living brands as the, one of the departments that's growing the fastest in the company. And um, what I love, this one I love, you know, respondents of a 2021 Nielsen survey indicated that they were 78% more likely to remember a company with a strong purpose. I mean, that says so much about purpose and how we connect to a brand. Um, I often really question this collective story we tell ourselves about, you know, there being a zero sum game in capitalism that like when I win, you lose. And I really believe that when businesses are thinking about more than just investors, they perform better. And these numbers really prove that. And they're also producing um, purpose as well. So if there's one thing I want you to take away from the first pointer, it's to know that you can do well and do good at the same time. And that paradigm in itself, in and of itself, is a mini revolution in the world of finance. So the second point is to know what you own and to detox your money. I wanna deliver a message that sometimes makes people squirm. 
especially if you're a hardcore financer, you are an investment banker. Acknowledging the emotional energy around money can fuel success. Here's the deal. Your investments should spark joy. What's the point? If you can, if you can detox your body, you know, I'm American, so we detox everything. You can detox your body, your relationships, your bathroom closet. You can definitely detox your money. You can use Marie Kondo's sparking joy paradigm um, for your money. So go ahead right now, ask yourself, are you really proud of your money today? What are your true values? These are questions that you can workshop later on. So write them down. Maybe you think about them before you go to bed tonight or in the morning, take out your journal. But are you really proud of where your money's invested and what are your true values? Part of this work is really looking within um, and being honest with yourself about where you could find deeper purpose. So remember that ignorance does not absolve us of responsibility and cultivating personal purpose in my financial life began with asking myself what matters to me? What lights me up? What do I want to see change? Um, I detox my money by taking time to scan my investment portfolios, taking breathers and meetings with financial advisors um, to really see where there can be more what I call feminine energy in my money. But that, and, and I, I call myself a hardcore investor. So I, I believe in that piece as well and being analytical, but I do believe that emotion is important so that I can build a more, a more sustainable, a stronger, and a more impactful strategy behind my money. So um, I, you know, just to let you know, gender equity is really important to me. And in the beginning of 2021, knowing that 98% of the money managed in the US is managed by white men, I decided to ask my advisor and just ask a simple question to do a review of, of women and people of color investing my capital. And the answer was very clarifying and empowering. It actually took two weeks to get me that answer, which I found very strange. But I think a lot of this is also about asking questions. I decided to make some adjustments on my own um, with smaller investments into female managers directly. And as a female fund manager myself, running Beyond Capital Ventures, it is my passion to forge a path for more female identifying people to claim their space. Because I know that only 7% of investment decision makers in my industry are female, and I want to change that. I also know that a disconnect between my values and my financial portfolio needs to close. Because as I mentioned earlier, no investment is neutral. How I spend my dollars ricochets in the world, it really does. Yesterday, I learned that Amazon is cutting down virgin forest to make cardboard boxes. I have kids. I admit I use Amazon from time to time, but that's going to change because that was a bit of a threshold for me um, in addition to other things. And so I know that that the way I spend my money ricochets and that's why it's really mad, why, why it really matters to me to clean this up and know that that's always a work in progress. It's never going to be perfect. So for you, when you center the issues that matter most for you, it can become a way of living. So allow them to be a consideration in every decision you make, maybe your consumer choices too. You know, what emerges for you and what will come about is an inclusive way of being that really can create value more than, for just, than just for yourself. So how do you identify your true values and define your personal purpose? Let's take a minute. I've listed here um, a list of values and I, I'm talking more about what I call core attributes in the book. So what do you believe in? For me, it's leadership, innovation, um, community, uh, commitment, compassion, um, health, happiness, fun, joy. These are all things that are important to me, but maybe take a minute to scan this list and see what stands out to you. When I did this exercise during the COVID pandemic lockdown, we had a virtual exercise where we dove deeply. I was actually in the process of writing my book. I realized that my values, my core attributes from a list like this directly mapped to the investments that I like the most in my portfolio. So that's another kind of follow-on exercise that you can do. And there's, of course, more on this in the good your money can do. The reality is, is that detoxing your money is really the ultimate act. 
of self-care. It's really the ultimate act of taking care of yourself. So step three, expand your definition of an investment. So you've done the work identifying your values and now how do you bring them into your finances? Well, one of the greatest misunderstandings around investing is that there has to be winners and losers. There has to be a zero sum game. We are taught to seek ways to make it fast and hyper efficient and to outperform the market, you know, outperform your friends while minimizing costs. This is true of other parts of our lives, but I think it's particularly problematic in investing. And the reality is um, when we try to optimize for efficiency and quick, quick impact, we really miss that it feels good to do good. The reality is that all things worthwhile take time and require malleability. And when we allow for it, this in money, in our money, and think about our finances differently, when we open the door for more empathy, more compassion and inclusiveness in our money, and we're not afraid to bring our values to the table, that's when you really start the real, what I call money makeover. As I mentioned earlier, money and investing do have an emotional value. For decades, scholars have noted a difference between genders when it comes to our approach to investing. Investing with the intent to fuel positive and change can make us better investors and be critical for our well-being as research links meaning and purpose to greater longevity. Who doesn't want to live longer? So I view this as really one of the greatest endorphin releasers out there. It does feel good to do good. Now think of investing not just as asking more from your money, but asking more from yourself. As I mentioned earlier, you are already an investor. And let's take another exercise. Think about the last three transactions that you made with your credit card or maybe with cash, whatever it was. Was it a coffee? Was it food for a pet, a cat maybe? Was it your child's school fees? Was it petrol for your car? Was it something else? The reality is, do these purchases reflect your values? Try to think of every transaction you make in the world as an investment that is a reflection of you. Step number four, you're almost there. You're getting all the tools. I'm excited for you. Is breaking down the boundaries to navigate the spectrum of values aligned investment strategies. So we know impact investing is the process of investing with the intent of creating positive change, be it social, environmental, or structural change, while also earning a financial return. It's a way to use your money to its fullest capacity and to help you find purpose. Conscious investing, which is the term that I use, is extending to all of your resources, including your money, but also your consumer choices. So I always love to hold up my reusable water bottle as a consumer choice that is consistent with my values, very convenient example. Why are we so quick to employ a scarcity mindset with our capital? Why is the status quo this way? Through impact investing, we can really break some boundaries. And when we allow our heart and conscience to play a role in our investing, we evolve our capabilities as a species. You may be wondering, well, what about the risk? This is a valid concern and one I really believe to be perpetuated by what we've been taught. The financial returns of impact investing continue to be comparable to those of traditional investing, but don't take it from me. Here's the research. The reality is, is that since 2010, the Global Impact Investing Network has released an annual report that says 95% of investors have met or surpassed their return expectations. Anecdotally, in our first fund, our returns beat the average of venture capital funds at Beyond Capital. So the the results are already there. And I believe that the next decade will be monumental for impact investing. Just as this is a time for businesses to prove compassion for their employees, their customers, the environment, the community, the shareholders, it's also a time for the impact investing space to mature. The everyday investor will see opportunities to divest and invest in the next wave of innovation, addressing the world's needs beyond profit alone. This is my, my goal. The reality is when we talk about emerging, emerging managers, emerging markets, anything emerging does not have to be risky or wrong. So how can we really rethink our approach to money and break our boundaries or maybe our thoughts about what might be risky? And I want you to ask yourselves, what is holding you back? 
Is there anything that you actually need to unlearn to build wealth while remaining true to yourself? These days, it is hard to know what real impact is, especially when you hear that one in every $3 is invested in socially responsible strategies. But when you dig deeper into ESG funds, a lot of them are just really big tech funds. The thing is, is that money is important enough to devote attention to. And when we take the time to learn about what conscious investing is and what it isn't, that's where we start to see progress. Concerns about greenwashing are definitely real. You won't transform your portfolio overnight. You need to start asking a lot of questions, ask about due diligence on impact and you know, maybe work with others to find out what are the right questions to be asking um, and how can you learn from others that have asked questions around greenwashing. I wanna share two stories of individuals that have become impact and conscious investors themselves. On the, right, on the left-hand side, you have Marla Mattinson, she and her partner have a consultancy called the Intimacy Experts for High Achieving Couples to find success in life and love, including how to have healthy relationships about money. Marla was always passionate about causes in her local community and started learning about impact investing through our work at Beyond Capital. She saw that centering impact and personal value, values, challenging traditional mindsets around money could help couples actually make breakthroughs with difficult financial conversations. So you're talking about more than just, here's what's in the bank account. You're saying, here's what impact our money is having together. So impact investing is now a much bigger part of Marla's business. On the right side is my friend, Abby, who's also an investor in Beyond Capital Ventures. He started a career in banking and private equity, was wildly successful, founded his own financial services firm that is bringing the principles of conscious leadership and management to, to provide employment for thousands of people in India. Perhaps he didn't always self-describe himself as an impact investor, but he exemplifies the qualities of conscious leadership. And he's driving CSR, corporate social responsibility initiatives, and shows that a leader and investor, as a leader and investor, he is thinking about all stakeholders. What I wanted, why I want to tell you these stories is that these are very two different, these are two very different people, but they broke traditional boundaries of investing very differently. And they used a lot of different skills. They used their, their consultancies, they use their um, employment, they use their uh, ability to manage people to be conscious. And I hope this really inspires you to think about what boundaries might be limiting you or what, where you might be able to do more. So there are too many different ways to get started to list here, but, but here are some kind of quick tips, some fun little gif um, to share with you around um, tips for becoming a conscious investor. You could get started through public markets. You could get started through private investment funds. You could get started through real estate um, or even thinking about your banking relationship. We list um, many vetted options um, on my online magazine called the Conscious Investor Online Magazine as well. I can put the link in the chat afterwards. But you don't have to start from scratch. If you've, def if you've defined your values already, you can line up with some of the UN sustainable, sustainable Development Goals so that you have your own kind of goal to track towards. For me, this is definitely gender equality. Um, I call it the climate emergency. Um, as, or in other words, climate action. Um, and I also care very deeply about no poverty as well. Um, but what I found fascinating about the UN SDGs is that every single country in the world signed off on these. And I actually know somebody who negotiated that, uh, those, those agreements and it was no small feat. Um, and the SDGs are a great um, display of the cracks in our society. And I think that that's kind of the, the sad part, but um, the great piece is that they allow for some goal setting. And so let's roll up our sleeves together and really get to work and set some goals around this. Last, the fifth and the, um, I think the most important point here is that this is the opportunity of our lifetimes to invest. Knowing how important it is to recognize the positive impact your money is having let's turn to earning more money. So I already mentioned that 85% of purpose-driven companies show positive top-line growth. And that figure drops to actually to 58% for companies that are not purpose-driven. 
The shift to conscious investing represents an opportunity really for everyone to build wealth with pride. In my early career on Wall Street, I was working in a world of really zero-sum game winners and losers and was lacking purpose. I was burnt out. I wasn't living my truth. And I was dreaming of what more of my finance skills could do for the world. Once I felt empowered to call myself an investor, which is kind of what I was talking about up until now, and I felt comfortable with who I am on the inside, I was able to reach for the highest level of contribution beyond myself. I confronted really my own stigmas and false beliefs around money. I really had forgotten where I came from, the roots of altruism growing in my family for generations. So I didn't mention that my family did live in Tanzania for over a decade. Um, and this is when I realized who I really was and began to build wealth and do good. This is my family driving from Cape Town to Tanzania in the 1950s. So as an investor in purpose-driven companies myself, driving impact and opportunity for low-income consumers, I really feel excited to wake up every day and do the hard work needed to source, screen, and invest in startups and emerging markets. We are a VC. We are a deal sourcing and screening machine. Um, that is the bread and butter of our work, um, and I absolutely love it. Our first fund produced top Quartel Venture Returns with actually an impact on this number just changed 59 million people, including 42 million women. And as a founder myself, I work hard, but contributing beyond myself as a venture investor really feels good. And we need to look at all global issues as powerful investment opportunities. That's how we're gonna solve them. We all agree the world is riddled, riddled with inequality and lacking access. We are also in agreement on the need to change this. I think that's why you showed up today, hopefully. But what are the solutions with the greatest efficacy in 2021 and the years to follow? I believe these answers largely begin with directing capital to emerging markets, which com comprise really more than half of the world's population. So my investment strategy addresses a market of about 1.7 billion consumers, all of whom live in Rwanda, India, Uganda, and Kenya. That's where I invest. That's really a giant number um, contained with only 2% of the world's countries. And it shows us how massive the emerging market landscape really is for impact investors like me. I've been doing this for 12 years. I've really seen firsthand how strategic capital can fuel a critical solution. And at Beyond Capital, we focus on these regions um, where we're seeing demographic shifts, digital inclusion, innovation-rich startups. I know Egypt is a really big part of the innovation hub, one of the innovation hubs on the continent. And the, they're providing exciting opportunities to meet increasing demand for emerg from emerging consumers. One example is Red Wing Labs, a drone healthcare logistics last mile distribution business in India that we are invested in. And it's definitely a company that we're excited about distributing blood, organs, vaccines, long tail drugs into rural areas in India, but also making money while doing so. Inclusive conscious investing is the future. Or organically, it's really become more mainstream, much because of the younger generation and progressively minded generations moving into the investment space. More millennials and Gen Zers are obtaining assets from their aging parents, which means that a massive $68 trillion wealth transfer is about to happen to a group of people that collectively view inclusivity, environmental welfare, and gender equality paramount. This is really a harbinger of future opportunity for companies and investors. I hope you see that as well. So here's your summary slide. You're welcome to screenshot. If you like, you can post on social media and tag me. I always love that. These five principles transform my life. They made me more honest about our collective story, about money. Does it really need to be that complicated? Does money need to be that complicated? We live in this age of vulnerability. I'm sure all of you have heard of Brene Brown. So why can't we all just be honest about our money? And here's why this matters for you. When you build wealth to be true to yourself, your whole life becomes your message. Money doesn't have to be a vulgar topic. You can be guilt-free. You can sleep at night knowing that you are taking steps 
on your personal journey towards becoming more conscious. I really came here today because I want you to feel more prosperous in a way that feels good for you, to line up your values, to earn more money, to be proud. My personal mission is to help people find more purpose in their money. That's why I wrote my book. That's why I have my online magazine. And I want to give more people on the outside looking in the keys. So I've, if I can do it, you know where I came from, you can do it too, because there really is no difference between you and me. We all have issues we care about. We all have values that define us. We all have purpose that fuels us. You decide how to bring those to the forefront of your daily life, whatever that looks like for you. If this resonates for you, I invite you to connect with me. You can, excuse me, become an ambassador of Beyond Capital. You can learn about the Venture Fund, which is cultivated an investor base, which is 70% women and people of color. Or you could just follow my online magazine, theconsciousinvestor.co. So I want to just ask you, you know, what action will you take today? Thank you so much for your time. And I would love to answer any questions and hear from you. Eva, thank you so much. Uh, that was really excellent. Eye opener and very inspiring. Uh, before we go to the audience, I just want to ask you about something uh, uh, you said that really caught my attention. It's no money is neutral. Yep. Uh, you know, in the world of impact, in, impact finance, um, I just want to ask, is there a distinction between doing no harm and doing good? Absolutely. Um, I think do no harm is passive. It's screening out. It's taking out tobacco, firearms, alcohol, whatever it is. Being active and doing good is, is proactively investing in where you want to have an impact. And where that's mostly prevalent is, you know, as I mentioned, gender equality, racial, racial equity, climate emergency, no poverty. Those are my kind of three, four key focus areas. And that's where I'm more active. So yes, absolutely. I think doing no harm is, is useful as a stepping stone. And in my book, I write about ESG screen funds as a stepping stone. If you just want to toe dip, get started, that's a great place to start. But um, I think it's better to be more active. And we do live in a time where there are significantly more active funds to seek out that are available to investors. Thank you so much. And for the audience, if you have a question, please feel free to raise your hand and I will call on you to ask your question directly to Eva. Uh, Eva, also I have two related questions. Like what beyond capital, what are uh, you know, the criteria or what do in general beyond capital looks for in the social enterprise that you invest in? And the related question is how do you measure impact both in the business that you invest mm -hmm. in and in the communities that your business, that your investees uh, impact? Sure. Um, so we look for companies that are providing access to need to haves. Um, so healthcare, financial inclusion, agriculture tools led by conscious leaders, leaders who are thinking about all stakeholders. We score conscious leaders we, um, you know, we have a kind of due diligence process around that. And then of course, we're looking for profitable and scalable business models. So we do not believe that in emerging markets, impact investing need be concessionary. I mean, sure, if you want to focus on an area that is concessionary, that is an option, but that's not, it doesn't have to be the norm. So those are kind of our, our initial criteria for the companies, purpose-driven businesses that we are investing in. When we measure impact, I mean, we've been doing this for 12 years. So we have a track record and we kind of have worked with a number of different scoring systems and, you know, kind of know what works and what doesn't work. Um, what we have been uh, typically doing is we take a company's kind of business activities and then we parse out metrics that come, you know, through that, through the business activities. When it comes to measuring in the community, um, some of the high level metrics are jobs created. Um, and then we think a little bit more about how many female jobs are created. Um, we think about full-time employees that are women. Um, we don't necessarily have the challenge of people of color because of the regions where we are investing, but then, you know, who are those full-time employees? What is the wage gap? 
um, with gender as well. Our three key impact themes are gender distribution and livelihoods. Um, and then finally, we have used blockchain enabled um, impact verification that is more community-based to get to the heart of your question, um, centered around healthcare of, you know, what's the increase in BMI um, to be able to see these trend lines over time um, and really understand, you know, how to get verified data around more community impact. I see two hands up, so I'll see if there are any additional questions. Maybe Vinette, do you, Sharma, do you want to unmute? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation with uh, great, great uh, slides, uh, Eva, and uh, it's a wonderful initiative also. But my basic question is regarding, you know, how can we bring some kind of positivity with impact investing because it does not re resonate as as such with you know with the you know uh, with what you call you know with sustainability you know because sometimes you know and impact investing is considered you know to be as similar uh, as to you know what you call capitalism and uh, you know too much of profits which are uh, you know not uh, considered to be the too much you know uh, as far as you know uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, for the in, in today's you know environment you know they are not considered to be the best words you know especially even after this uh, pandemic, you know, we are seeing these uh, large corporates, you know, uh, getting much more, uh, you know, uh, uh, accumulating wealth, you know, uh, uh, despite all these, you know, uh, issues with the, with that. So how can we make impact investing, you know, a lot more, you know, resonate with the, you know, uh, especially, especially in the, you know, uh, developing countries, you know, for example, yeah. In India, in, in Africa, etc., you know, we find that, you know, that, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we, where basically you need, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, groundwork, you know, and we can't, you know, uh, uh, basically completely neglect, you know, Wall Street for that matter, even large corporates, you know, for example, in case of, you know, impact investing is going into, you know, eye testing, for example, you know, uh, and maybe, you know, you can provide eye testing, you know, which can give very uh, in initial diagnosis, you know, or results, you know, but after some time, you know, they, that you definitely will have to rely on you know for at uh, for at corporates you know for example for you know surgery for that matter or for that matter uh, providing you know these uh, what you call glasses or for that matter you know a, a sure. long term you know uh, uh, well being of the patient you know e even if for that matter even in the electric uh, mobility space we are seeing you know at some point of time you know you have to rely on uh, large corporates for example to for providing you know these uh, batteries or for that matter you know um, yeah. metals etc you know and and, and uh, some of these things are a lot more carbon intensive so impact yes. investing basically is a, a good thing but how can we basically try to bring it at uh, scale while taking you know con government into confidence and uh, basically you know trying to bring balance you know because wall street definitely uh, uh, basically can't be you know ignored completely you know so so that you know there yeah. is a trust maintained you know trust trust and balance is maintained yeah thanks very much sure thank you so much great question number one um the the like the integration of impact into a business into the fabric of a business i think can really be a, a driving force even when that business then needs to go and you know maybe start sourcing from more mainstream manufacturers or take investment from larger investors that are more commercially oriented um, there are ways to link the what i call bake the impact into a business model I, you know, I would say that my observation is that that's actually easier to do in emerging markets because there are a lot of either industries that have not been disrupted. So med supply is one in my portfolio where in East Africa, there are very sleepy incumbents. They don't, they're really asleep at a switch and you come in and you disrupt and you actually provide value to your customer. You have massive impact on patient affordability, quality of care, but you make money at the same time and you're buying from big suppliers. So there's, you have to bake the impact into the business model. And then as the company grows, the integrity of the leader um, and what I call the conscious leader, the leader who's thinking about all stakeholders is very important in ensuring that that impact remains baked into the business model and there is no mission drift. 
Um, so this is kind of the secret sauce. The last piece I would say though is um, structural innovation. So I am raising money from the US and Europe. I am deploying it in emerging markets. And what I'm doing with 10% of the general profit, the general partner profit share is I am giving that to every founder in the portfolio so that the money just doesn't go back to Silicon Valley and London and New York and get you know put into a bunch of different startups in the US and Europe. It goes back into the hands of the founders that created businesses who then invest that in the way that they see fit um, in their market. So we are structurally innovating. And that's another way that I think you, you then create a more sustainable way of having impact be long term, um, especially when you know needing to take capital maybe from Wall Street um, groups. Uh, you know, at one point, I think we are going to really see a tipping point where Wall Street needs more impact and acknowledges more impact. And we're not there yet, but we're getting there. I know there are some other questions. Leila, you're, you're the hand that I see. So if you would like to unmute and ask, that would be great. Hi, Ava. Um, thank you so much. This was such an important talk and the information that you shared is something that is just so vital, especially at the time that we're in right now. Um, I'm a alumni of AUC. I worked at the Gerhardt Center actually for several years and um, I was raised in California, which is where I am now. I wanted to ask, I'm in the process of building a consultancy called um, Intentional Growth Consulting. And it related a lot to what you are talking about. You're on the investing side, but I wanted to ask what have you seen, especially in the United States, um, what have you seen with companies who maybe are not, it's not in their business model to be impactful and to look at the social impacts of their actions what changes or what solutions or what, what's missing that you think could be solved? Because that's kind of the focus of what I want to be doing is working with companies who maybe they're not there yet, but they have the potential or they have the intention they want to, or they could, mm. but they're not there yet. And how can we alter their business model? I don't mean to be a broken record, but I think a lot of this comes down to leadership. So if the, if the leadership intention is there, then great. Um, if they're working in an industry, I think then it, then it comes down to the industry. So let's say, I mean, extreme case working in oil, ga oil and gas, and there's an intention to help transition um, to a green economy or help decarbonize, then it's incumbent upon that leader to find the best strategy. And you know, I think maybe just continuing on with that example, I mean, it is well known that carbon capture has been, is possible and has been possible for decades. It's just that nobody's needed to do it. There's no reason to capture carbon. Um, and so a leader who really believes in that transition, I think would take advantage of an opportunity like that and maybe sell that carbon to another business that, you know, needs it for something else, right? So I think, um, I, I think that the answer really lies in leadership and creative, creative entrepreneurship and in some cases design thinking around what a business, like what the purpose of the business is and how it can expand beyond um, just the core activities. Um, those are, those are, I think are the, the, the points that I think are most relevant. Um, I mean, look, you can't force a leader who does not believe in sustainability or impact to inculcate that into their business, that will be an absolute disaster. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there, need, there needs to be the intention. And then there are great tools like B Corporation. Um, you know, I'm sure you know that certification. It's a certification where, you know, for people planet profit um, and they can learn from other B Corporations and be a part of that community um, as well as conscious capitalism in the U.S. is another great movement for company founders. So there's a, there are a lot of resources out there that can really help. Thank you. Thank you. Abbas? Do you want to unmute Abbas? Still have your hand up. Okay. Can you help Go us ahead. Piotr, please to unmute him, please? 
I did. I asked, uh, asked on mute. Oh, I'm here. Yes, he's there. Okay. Hi there. Hi there. Excuse me. I'm coffee shopping it right now. So excuse me if the background and the noise so much uh, for an excellent. Um, Ava, I had a quick question and I don't know if it's the right way to ask this question. It's a, it's kind of a technical issue about mixing philanthropic dollars and impact investing and, and venture dollars. Um, just curious about from a reporting standpoint, like those dollars are, are those dollars, I imagine they're treated differently in tax, you know, for tax implications. Um, how, how is that, that sort of the mixing of those funds managed from, a, you know, from kind of a reporting and, and business management point of view? It's a, it's a very new space for me. I consult community foundations on equity and anti-harm work. Um, and so I'm very curious about this space. Does that question, does that question resonate at all? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, we don't, we at Beyond Capital don't mix philanthropic philanthropic funding and um, investment capital. Um, we've always been an investor. Um, our first fund did take in mostly donations um, to fund our pool of capital, but we've always been a VC. We really, really have never given a grant to a company. That being said, I do see grants on cap tables. I do see philanthropy on cap tables. And this is what I think you're asking. So feel free to give me a thumbs up um, if I'm moving in the right direction, um, yes. here, but okay. So I look, I think, I actually think there's a little bit of deception from time to time. I don't think it's like intentional deceiving, but, um, you know, founders are not, you know, intentionally trying to deceive investors, but a lot of, a lot of founders will book philanthropy as revenue. And when doing due diligence on a business, we have to kind of strip that out because philanthropy is not revenue. And philanthropy is often limited in or restricted in terms of what the money can do or time bound. And so we take that out and we you know, recently negotiated our sixth deal and the valuation cap was lowered from what they had previously taken in prior safes because the prior safes were including philanthropy in the revenue numbers. And we did not think that that was you know, what should be included going forward. Um, so I think it's important to just be really deep in the financials on that um, because every company kind of deals with it differently. Um, I've also seen businesses, you know, get large grants from very large, well-known institutions that we all know that would roll off our tongues first. And um, those grants, you know, that money can't be spent for other things. And so when the company starts to run out of cash, they're kind of in this weird position where they can pay for certain things, but they can't pay for the other things. And as they're raising money, it's a bit of a conflict because investors, VC investors are saying, well, you have cash. And they're saying, yes, it's, it's, it's restricted. So there are a number of kind of points where I think digging in and really asking the right questions around that, or maybe just being outright about your question directly to a business is very important. From the investor's perspective, I understand that investors have all different types of pools of capital, but I do think right where we are now in most jurisdictions, there is a way to use philanthropy to make an investment. And I think that if we are gonna to move towards a system of reforming capitalism and reimagining capitalism, the best tool is investing. But then again, I told you I'm a hardcore, hardcore investor. I'm not a hardcore capitalist, but I'm a hardcore investor. And um, I do think that that's kind of the best tool at our disposal right now. A philanthropy is good, but I would really reserve it for concessionary investments. Okay, that's actually, that's actually very clarifying. Thank you so much, Ava. Thank you. Ava, I really want to thank you, thank you for a very, it's been very inspirational and a mind opener. And I'm, I'm sure the audience will, will, will also agree with this. Uh, we have one more question, Can we take Ali. One more from question? yeah, let's take yes. it. Please, Catherine. Hi. Now it works. Uh, thank you for this presentation, and I would like if you could elaborate a little bit on the here still very vague term of social enterprise. What, what, what does, uh, what is a social enterprise? Sure. Um, well, uh, I, it's not a term I like to use because I think that 
in the minds of the general public, it implies philanthropy and not like actual business. I like to use the term purpose-driven business, a business that has purpose. But, you know, classically, a social enterprise is a business that has, has the intention to generate social and in some cases environmental return alongside financial profits. Um, Muhammad Yunus actually in his writings defines social enterprise as a business that actually does reinvest the profits in, entirely back into the social mission of the company. Um, so that, you know, that is something that I think goes a little further than my use of the definition, the early use of the definition, which was just an enterprise that was double or triple bottom line, meaning it had, you know, profit and people or profit people and planet as kind of beneficiaries um, or, you know, you could take the stakeholder model and say shareholders, employees, customers, and then environment, et cetera. Um, so that is the term. Um, and that's how I would define it for you. Does that clarify, Catherine? Yes. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. Uh, okay, I think uh, Kariman just joined us, um, so I let her sort of. Uh, Kariman, do you want to join in? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. I just got disconnected. Uh, thank you so much, Ava. That was uh, really, really an eye opener uh, um, conversation. Uh, we really do thank you, and we appreciate uh, um, you being here with us. Thank you so much, Ava. Thank you. It's been so great to be here. Thanks for the time. And uh, please, you know, everybody can connect with me um, and find me on LinkedIn. Would love to hear from everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Eva. And thank you so much, everyone, for uh, the great question and the great discussions. We're going to have a pause, <laughs> a break during Ramadan um, for the webinars. And we will be back, inshallah, after Ramadan. Thank you so much, everybody. And enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you again, Eva. Bye. Bye, everyone.